for the meeting. Um, let me begin by making an obvious but quite important point, and that is that when we talk about the Arab Spring or the Arab revolutions, we're talking about quite a diverse set of situations and circumstances. And in fact, music has played some part in most of those situations. Um, I'm not gonna have time to talk about every country affected by the Arab Spring or every artist that, um, that has had something to say about it, but hopefully I will be able to put out some helpful themes for the discussion. Certainly I'm going to talk about the blossoming of creativity which followed the fall of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt at the beginning of last year. The music which, if you like, became the soundtrack to the Festival of the Oppressed, as Lenin once described revolutions. But I want to make it clear that music doesn't just document and celebrate political change after the event, I want to make the argument that music is very much at the heart of struggle a lot of the time. I want to make the argument that music is a, uh, a political weapon. I think that music can bring confidence and courage to people. I think it can bring cohesion to uh, groups of people, particularly on demonstrations. And, um, and even in armed struggle, music sometimes has a role to play, as this completely bizarre picture from Libya shows. Um, I'm going to duck the issue of what side these guys are on at this particular point in the conflict in Libya because um, my belief is that the, the uprising in Libya, was, in Libya was effectively hijacked by NATO and the West, I think in an attempt by the West to put the brakes on the whole of the Arab Spring. But I'm going to avoid getting uh, into that in any more detail by acknowledging straight away that if music is, as I'm arguing, a political weapon, then it is a, also a weapon that can be picked up by either side in any dispute. A bit later on, I'm going to play you a song written in opposition to Bashar al-Assad, the dictator in Syria. But Assad himself tried to use music to shore up support for his regime in the early days of the uprising, when, when he was ordering the bombardment of Homs, he was also ordering that patriotic songs be played in public spaces across Syria. So music plays a number of different roles. Uh, it's fine, you know, it sounds fine. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. We're, we're good as we are. Thanks very much, though. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it just sounds surprisingly good. Yeah. Um, where was it? Yeah, so music plays a number of different roles. I think the other thing that we need to be clear about is that culture is very important in the Middle East, arguably more important than, uh, well, than, than where I'm from. I mean, in a sense, perhaps Ireland is a bit more like the Middle East than, than, than England in this sense, in the sense that music and dance and poetry are all quite deeply ingrained in the culture and connected with politics. So culture matters and it's very contested in the Middle East. The best example of that is the way that the Israelis constantly try to appropriate, try to steal traditional Palestinian culture and rebrand it as their own in an attempt to give some credibility to one of the central myths of Zionism, the myth that Palestine was a land without a people, or at least a land without a people with much culture to speak of. And therefore you get these weird situations. I'm told that if you fly first class on the Israeli uh, carrier El Al, you'll be greeted by Israeli flight attendants wearing traditional Palestinian thob, tr traditional Palestinian dress, and they'll say, look at my wonderful traditional Israeli uh, dress. If you want to keep fit and have a bit of fun in Zionist communities all around the world, you can enrol for Israeli dance. Of course, it's not Israeli dance at all. It's an adaptation of Dabka, traditional Palestinian dance, probably with a bit of Egypt Egyptian belly thrown in. Now, this attempt by Israel to simultaneously uh, steal Palestinian culture and rebrand it and to make it very difficult indeed for Palestinians themselves to practice the culture has resulted in a situation where quite a lot of Palestinians have embraced the slogan to exist is to resist. Uh, there's a, fr a friend of mine, a Palestinian singer called Reem Kalani, who I will mention again later on in this talk. She described to me with great pride her traditional Palestinian breakfast breaking the freshly baked bread, dipping it in the lovely Palestinian olive oil, and then into the za'atar, the mix of thyme and sumac, salt and toasted sesame. And she said that for her to eat a traditional Palestinian breakfast was an act of resistance. Now, I respectfully disagree with Reem in terms of the way that she's defining resistance. I think we have to define resistance as some attempt to challenge the power of the oppressor, be it political, economic, or ideological, in a way that just eating your breakfast can't. But 
her statements do underline just how important how contested culture is in, uh, in, in this part of the world. Um, arguably, the Arab Spring, as it became known, uh, began with the Palestinian inti Intifada, but of course the, the term wasn't coined until Tunisia and Egypt. So let's, let's have a little look at, um, at Tunisia first of all. I mean, the first thing to say about Tunisia is that there's quite a long tradition of people singing out against the regime. Songs sung against the, uh, the regime that didn't begin in 2011 or 2010. As far back as 1972, there was a troubadour called El Hedi Guela, who he was actually inspired by the events that he saw um, unfolding across Europe, but particularly in Paris in May 68, the uprising of the workers and the students in May 68 inspired him. And in 1972, he wrote a very mournful, lamenting sort of song, which bemoaned the fact that so many Tunisians were being forced to emigrate because, uh, because the, the, the regime was so awful. It wasn't Ben Ali at the time, it was his predecessor, a guy called Habib Bougiba. I'm pleased to say that El Hedi Guela, the song, by the way, was, was the one that, that I just pressed stop on. Um, it was the last song that you heard as you were waiting for the meeting to begin. I'm pleased to say that he did um, live to see the overthrow of the regime. El Hedi Guela actually died earlier on this year. Um, now, in recent years, it's been music from outside of Tunisia and indeed from outside of the region that has tended to influence people, particularly young people in Tunisia. Uh, a comrade who was in Tunisia a couple of years before the revolution told me that a lot of young people were listening to Bob Marley precisely because Bob Marley represented for them rebel music, represented a, a revolutionary spirit. And of course, hip hop has been a big influence. And in fact, it was a 21 year old Tupac Shakur fan, a guy called uh, a guy who called, calls himself El General, who wrote one of the most important musical catalysts of the Tunisian revolution. Um, the song, I'm going to play you some of the song, it's, um, it's called Wrestler Bled, which is kind of a play on words. It, um, it means leader of the nation or Mr. President. And I'm going to play you some of the video. The video is quite interesting, actually, because... It begins with this vintage bit of footage um, of Ben Ali. And he's speaking to this, uh, this little boy in the school um, for the sake of the cameras, trying to appear to be very benign. Um, but the boy has clearly been told some truth about the regime because he appears to be terrified of Ben Ali and won't say a word to him, much to Ben Ali's frustration. So that, that's the start of the video. But this is Restler Bled by El General. There's a translation that runs along the bottom of the screen. Don't worry about trying to read every word. It's a slightly inaccurate translation anyway. I'm going to read out some of the salient lines afterwards. So have a, have a quick listen. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Blade by El General. Um, 
can only shortcut on these computers. Forgive me. I've got to switch that over to. Let me read you out some of the lyrics because they're all quite interesting. Um, you know these words that make your eyes weep as a father does not want to, ch to hurt his children then this is a message from one of your children who is telling you of his suffering we are living like dogs now what i find interesting is that although this is damning about its assessment of where tunisia is at at the time it's still fundamentally an appeal for reforms and you see this time and time again in revolutionary situations um, it begins with people appealing for reforms and then when those appeals either fall on deaf ears or perhaps more commonly are met with repression, then the demands change to the overthrowing of the regime to revolutionary demands. And sure enough, that's how it played out in Tunisia. That song was released on the 7th of November 2010. Notice that's um, more than a month before the self immolation of Mohamed Bouazizi. When I say released, by the way, I mean posted to uh, YouTube and Facebook by regime protests. The protests are met with uh, repression. And sure enough, then El General, El, El General releases another song on the 22nd of December called Tunis Bledna. Tunisia is our country. Let me read you some of the lyrics from this second song that came out towards the end of December. Tunisia is our country with politics or blood. Tunisia is our country and her men will never surrender. Tunisia is our country, the whole people hand in hand. Tunisia is our country and today we must find the solution. Now notice, he's no longer speaking truth to power, as the Quakers sometimes put it. Now he's recognising that, uh, that the solution lies in the hands of the people. Now this, of course, was a message too far, so far as the regime was concerned. And on the 6th of January, there was a knock on his door. It was 30 state security officers acting, they said, on the direct orders of Ben Ali. Uh, El General was thrown into prison. The good news is that by then, the revolution was in full swing. Within a week, Ben Ali had to flee the country, and I'm pleased to say that El General was released. Now, the song that I played you was an important musical catalyst, not only of the Tunisian revolution, but it travelled absolutely immediately uh, because of, of the internet, because of social media, and also because there is a shared language across this region. That helps, particularly when it comes to hip-hop. Um, but it travelled immediately to Egypt and he received several invitations from revolutionaries who were beginning to gather in Tahrir Square to come and perform the song there. He couldn't take up those invitations, I don't think he had his travel documents together. But I think it's very exciting, that kind of immediate internationalism uh, that, 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 often, that we often see happening when it comes to music. And not only music actually, it was also, it was not just the songs, but also the slogans of Tunis Tunisia that found their way to Egypt. One of the most important ones was the people demand that the regime steps down or the regime is overthrown. Now, in Tahrir Square in Cairo, there was a 23-year-old student and part-time singer-songwriter who heard these chants coming from Tunisia, another chants reverberating around Tahrir Square, and he thought to himself, how much better if I could set them to music? They're getting a bit repetitive, they're getting a bit boring. It'd be much better if these uh, were set to music. Now, his name was Rami Esom, and... In attempting to do this, by putting together slogans and quite a simple piece of acoustic guitar music, he created really one of the anthems of the Egyptian revolution, a song called Erhal, meaning leave. I'm going to play you some of Erhal. It begins with the, uh, the Egyptian people are on one hand. Then it, it, uh, then it says, I think I'm getting the order of these slogans right, then it says Erhal, meaning leave, aimed at that time, of course, at Hosni Mubarak. Then you hear down, down Mubarak, and then the slogan that I just played you, uh, the people demand that the regime steps down. Let me play you Air Hal. This recorded during the 18 days in Tahrir Square uh, last year. I'm terrible at operating these things. There we go. Yeah. 
Air Howl by Rami Esselm. Um, he performed that song and other songs day after day in uh, Tarrier Square and more than once received violence, first of all, from the, uh, from the pro-Hosni Mubarak thugs. Um, but then later, after the overthrow of Mubarak, in March, when the army forcibly cleared the square, he was arrested and taken to a makeshift prison. I think it was actually one of the public libraries that the army were using at the time. And the jailers knew him by name. This was, this was a targeted arrest, and he was quite badly beaten. So like El General before him, he paid the price for performing this music. You can find um, a video of him on YouTube describing that, experiences, that, that experience and, and showing some horrible bruises, which you can see a little bit of in this black and white slide. Um, but um, I'm pleased to say that he was eventually released and, um, and continued to perform that song, but talked no longer about Hosni Mubarak, but changed it to the military council. So he, uh, he's, he's still making music at the moment. Um, I'm pleased to say. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of, one of the most interesting musical aspects of the Egyptian Revolution was the prevalence of music written nearly a hundred years ago by a long dead and prolific Egyptian composer called Said Dalwish uh, and his long-term musical partner, the, the lyricist Badi Khairi. Now, Dalwish is is a very interesting guy. Um, I mentioned Reem Kalani earlier on in the talk, and I should credit her at this point in this talk. She helped me with the research for this talk, and particularly for this part of this talk. And she described Saeed Darwish to me as being like a cross between George Gershwin and Woody Guthrie. Um, certainly, he, he grew up in a working class part of Alexandria. He moved to a working class part of Cairo. He worked for a time as a bricklayer, and his music really always talked about the lives of working class people. He, um, he, he wrote songs about manual workers, about women workers at that time. I'm going to play you a little excerpt from uh, a song called Pull Up Your Belt for luggage carriers, for porters. Um, if there's any musicologists out there, the, the maqam, the mode, is hejaz, which is a very famous mode in Arabic music. And the genre is Egyptian musical theatre, which was, which was huge at this time. This was recorded in 1920. Don't worry about uh, translation. Just have a listen to the song. So this is Said Dalwish with, uh, with Pull Up Your Belt. Say, Darwish, pull up your belt. Now, um, they also wrote songs about some of the most marginalised people in Cairo at the time, uh, the minority black community that was living there at this time, uh, drug addicts as well. They wrote songs about, and they also both wrote, Say, Darwish and the lyricist Badi Khairi both wrote songs in opposition to religious sectarianism. In fact, there's a great story that when Badi Khairi's dad died, Said Darwish decided that he would do the right thing and he bought some flowers and went to pay his respects. He went down to the Coptic church in Cairo and waited and waited, but the funeral procession never turned up. So he went down to Badi Khairi's house and found the whole family sitting around reading the Quran. Now, the fact that these two men had worked together for so long, they were the George and Ira Gershwin of, of, uh, of, of Cairo, of, of, of Egypt, and they didn't know each other's religion. I think that just goes to show how little religious divisions meant to uh, the two men. 
Um, I'm sure that some of you will have heard of the, of the Egyptian, the great Egyptian singer Um Kafum. Uh, I think she's absolutely brilliant. The first time I went to Cairo, it was her voice that was on the radio as I drove into the city, and I thought, what better way to see Cairo for the first time than listening to Um Kafum's beautiful voice? I love her music, but I have to tell you, comrades, that politically she's a bit of a Gary Barlow figure. That, <laughs> that is to say she was always quite happy to sing for monarchs and, and for the establishment. <coughs> Said Dalwish was always the complete opposite. He was always an anti-establishment figure, and he was writing songs at a time when the, uh, the power of songs to influence people's political thinking was growing. The, uh, the phonograph, the early record player, had been introduced to Egypt in 1904, and sheet music as well meant that songs could travel more widely and more quickly than ever before. And therefore, when Said Dalwish and Badi Khairi wrote a number of songs in opposition to British rule, in Egypt, those songs quite quickly became anthems of the 1919 rebellion. Um, and actually lots of these songs, those songs in particular, were, were covered in the months leading up to the 2011 revolution, covered by uh, young bands in Egypt, sung by protesters and so on. There's one of those songs that I want to tell you the story of. And I want to tell you the story of this particular song not because it's one of my favourites by Darwish, it, it isn't actually, but because I think that the story of the song illustrates quite well the complicated relationship that exists between music and culture and society and politics. Because we must be aware that it's not the case that a song just pops out of the head of a talented individual and then influences politics, end of story. In fact, of course, every piece of art, every song, comes out of a partic particular time and place, set of social relations and contradictions and it's mediated by all those things. Some songs do indeed then go on to influence politics, but then as society changes, so too does the context in which the song is heard and the meaning of the song can change. So it's a complicated, it's a dialectical relationship that exists between culture and politics. The story of this particular song illustrates this well. The song is called Biladi Biladi, which means my homeland, which means, uh, yeah, homeland, my homeland. Um, I'm gonna play you some, a small group of protesters singing it in Tahrir Square from January of last year. Um, but this was sung all over Egypt uh, during the time uh, leading up to and, and immediately after the overthrow of Mubarak. So have a quick listen. You get the idea. Now, as I say, the song began as an anthem uh, of the 1919 uprising against British rule. Um, interesting footnote about that uprising. It was actually the, uh, the revolutionaries who cut the phone lines uh, in the city in, 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 in an attempt to isolate Cairo from London and give the revolution a better chance of success. The complete opposite of what happened in 2011 when, of course, the regime cut the phone lines and the internet. Um, the rebellion was ultimately unsuccessful. The British-backed establishment stayed in place. Uh, Said Dalwish died uh, in 1923, aged just 31. Some people think he was poisoned. Other people think he had a massive heart attack after taking too much cocaine. Either way, he was dead. The establishment who so opposed his ideas really buried his legacy. And we hear nothing more, really, about Darwish until Nasser comes to power in the 1950s. In fact, uh, Cairo hosts a conference of Arabic music in 1936 and Said Darwish hardly gets a mention. Now, in the 1950s, Nasser comes to power and this song, Biladi Biladi, is uh, adopted as a sort of an unofficial anthem of pan-Arab nationalism. But then in 1979, under Sadat, two things happen. 
Don't forget, Sadat is already quite unpopular with the, with the whole layer of society by this time because he's starting to push through uh, neoliberal economic policies. We've had the bread rights two years before. And in 1979, he signs... Um, a very controversial peace agreement with Israel, an agreement which a lot of people in Egypt and throughout the region saw as a complete sellout. And he uh, adopted Biladi Biladi as the official, official national anthem of Egypt. Now, for him to do that, for him to adopt this song as the national anthem at that moment in Egyptian politics, was for many people a betrayal of the song, a betrayal of the song's radical uh, political roots. Therefore, I think that when the protesters sing Biladi Biladi in Tahrir Square, a revolutionary situation inspired by what's just happened in Tunisia, uh, a revolutionary situation w w which will reverberate beyond the borders of Egypt, one in which there are Palestinian flags flying in solidarity with the Palestinians, I think that they are doing several things. They are connecting the struggle against British or Western imperialism of 100 years ago with the struggle against the Western backed dictator now. They're, they are, um, in my view, also uh, reclaiming the song to its radical political tradition. Um, they say Dawish's influence was also felt in Tahrir Square and elsewhere across Egypt, sort of indirectly. He was a big influence on uh, a political singer popular in the 1960s, Sheikh Imam, who, uh, all, who in turn influenced um, Azza Balba, who was a singer and actress popular in the 80s. She sort of came out of retirement to sing songs in Tahrir Square. So what we see in Tahrir Square is some very new, in, some very new music, innovative music, but also um, a real connection with a long political musical history. Now, before I run out of time, are we down to that already? No, good. <laughs> <laughs> Before we run out of time, I want to uh, say a few things about Syria. The first thing to say about Syria is that even more, significantly more than in Tunisia or Egypt, the musical establishment are absolutely uh, tightly knitted in with the political establishment, and therefore it tends not to be the professional musicians who have come up with the best, uh, with the best protest songs, with the best songs of opposition to the regime. When you saw those um, demonstrations in towns all across Syria last year, the chants were often written by and... and, and uh, night after night, led by other sorts of workers, uh, in some cases professional footballers, builders, in, in the case of the song that I'm about to play you by a firefighter and part-time poet. Why not? Fantastic. Um, a firefighter and, and part-time poet called Ibrahim Kashush. Um, let me play you the footage. This is from, I think, the very end of June last year. The city is Hama. Um, I'll play you the song and then I'm going to tell you a bit more about it. I'll drop it in somewhere there. There we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, that's quite good. Um, <laughs> what I love about that is that it's um, it's written in a traditional sort of folk form for the region, that call and response form, which I think uh, makes for incredibly powerful uh, political music. And once again, it travelled very quickly across borders. This is a group of Palestinians in Ramallah uh, protesting against the UN because the UN at that time were completely ignoring the fact that, that the, the, the hunger strikes were taking place. Same song, they've got rid of the reference to Bashar and substituted it with references to the UN. Now, the performance that you saw in Hammer, in Syria, as I say, it's thought that the guy singing there wrote the song. I say it's thought that that's the case. It's thought that he is a firefighter. His name, we know, Ibrahim Kashush. I say that these things, uh, we, we, we can't be absolutely certain. It's very difficult for obvious reasons to get accurate information out of Syria at the moment. But Ibrahim Kashush, the guy who was most certainly performing the song in that footage, just a few days after that was shot, his body washed up in the Orontes River, his throat had been slit, and his vocal cords had been ripped out. Let me begin, let me begin to, uh, to, to sum up with, um, with a few thoughts, or a, a couple of thoughts and a couple of questions, really, I think. Um, the first thing to say is that all the musicians I played in this short presentation were performing music either before the revolutions in question began or certainly before they were proved to be in any sense successful. And therefore these are brave individuals and I think that they've given great courage to other revolutionaries and that alone I think is a, is a huge political contribution that they've made. Um, and of course they've all paid a price in their different ways. I forgot to mention that Azza Balba actually served time in prison under Sadat for singing the songs of Shaky Man. They've all paid a high, pra a pr uh, a high price for their courage. Uh, the next thing to say is that although these are not unsung heroes, they are unsigned heroes. Um, the music that you've heard would have gone directly from the musicians to, uh, to other revolutionaries, to protesters, via either a megaphone or a PA system, or, of course, social media, YouTube and Facebook in particular. None of the music, thank goodness, is filtered through, through the usually quite conservative gatekeepers of the mainstream music industry. I mean, after, after um, the revolution, after it was successful in toppling Mubarak and the whole world, some, some people quite reluctantly, but the whole world was starting to celebrate it, then of course the mainstream music industry sort of jumps on the bandwagon. You have mainstream uh, pop musicians like Mohammed Munir claiming that his latest single is about the revolution. I'm not at all convinced that it was. Uh, you have people like Lauren Hill wanting to collaborate with the Arabian Nights, a Cairo-based hip-hop crew. Fantastic. But that comes after, after the event. So the music that I have been playing to you this evening is, is music which is outside of the mainstream. Um, and then a couple of questions. I'm curious to know really what this revolutionary, uh, this ongoing revolutionary process will do for music and for creativity. I mean, if there's, if there, if there's anyone in the room who has been in the region um, recently, I'd be very interested to hear an update because it seems to me that if a huge number of people get a glimpse of another possible world, then that changes things. Even if there are setbacks, uh, an Egyptian, a young Egyptian revolutionary said to me the other day that the difference now, though there are disappointments with the new uh, with the new government, the difference is that people will not be quiet anymore. And I'm interested to know how that's being translated uh, into music. So, you know, any updates from the region would be, would be very welcome. But finally, I think we need to contemplate the question of what music can do, not only for revolution, but for our own struggles um, here. 
hopefully this presentation has demonstrated to you that music does play an important role. Now, I'm not arguing that music is centrally important in political struggle. It isn't. Strikes, occupation, occupations, protests, these things are centrally important. Political organisation is centrally important. If you haven't yet joined the SWP, I would, I would urge you to do so. But as I say, hopefully I've demonstrated that music is nonetheless very important. It plays an important role. The ruling class take it very seriously, its potential threat very seriously. I think we need to take it more seriously. I think we need to, to talk about this, to theorise it and, and, to, and to understand better how we can use music in our struggle for a better world. So thank you for listening.